Hello everybody, welcome back. Today we're doing another Shakespeare Heroes video. Uh, I just want to preface this video by saying thank you all for watching. Uh, I'm going to be taking a break from uploading for a little bit because I have to return back to school uh, and finish my undergrad, but I really do appreciate everybody sticking around. Uh, and I'll be back eventually, hopefully around the summer, uh, to keep uploading videos like this for you. Uh, today's video is going to be on strain gauges and rosettes, which is a very easy topic. We've covered uh, pretty much all the bases that we needed to on our previous videos. Uh, but we're going to be using the following problem to explain what it's all about. So at a point on the free steel surface, uh, it has a material property that we're going to talk about, which is called Poisson's ratio. It's going to have a value of 0 0.3 for that. We have a strain rosette, which is used to obtain the following normal strain data. And each of these strain gauges are actually developing a normal strain that it's determining based on its placement in the rosette. And it's asking us to use this information to determine the strain components, uh, normal strain x, y, and the shearing strain x, y. Then it wants us to determine the maximum shearing strain and principal strains uh, as we've done previously. And it's all very simple stuff that we've done before. But what is different in these problems? We're going to talk about that for a little bit. So what is a strain gauge? That's the first thing we should probably cover because a lot of us have never heard of that before. Uh, a strain gauge it's pretty much just a small foil conductor uh, that we're going to be placing on an element and it's going to be integrally bound to it. So that pretty much means we're just going to stick it right on and it's going to uh, deform the same way the element will deform at that location it's bounded to. So when we stress the element, the strain gauge will elongate or compress or change in size. So why are they useful? They're useful because we can take these strain gauges and arrange them in a set configuration, which is known as a rosette, which can allow us to determine the uh, strain at a point of interest. So these rosette uh, configurations will triangulate at certain points to allow us to uh, calculate properties of the element, such as the principal stress at a point, principal strain, and multiple things like that. But what changes now in strain rosette problems that previously we didn't consider? Well, now we need to shift our focus from thinking in plane. And when I say in plane, that means we're looking at one plane uh, of stress or one plane of focus in the problem. So we would only be looking at x, y in our previous uh, principal videos. And then we would say that the principal stress coming out of the page or the principal strain coming out would equal to zero. So now we're, sh we're shifting our focus to plane strain, which means that epsilon z or normal strain z is not going to equal zero in our cases. So we're going to have to look at a derivation to figure out what that strain in z is going to be. Now similarly, we have uh, derived all of the conventions that we're going to use for problems like this. We have the positive counterclockwise uh, angle from x, which is going to be used to plug into these formulas. And what these formulas are, are the uh, calculations for the strain that is calculated by the gauge. So we can actually uh, plug in values of strain at x and strain at y from the point and the shearing strain as well to determine what the gauge would actually read. Uh, and we can also determine all of the uh, in-plane strains and orientations that we've discovered previously in previous videos from these rosettes. But now we must consider epsilon z, obviously, which is down here. And it's using a value called Poisson's ratio. And this, uh, this geometric or material property is going to be covered later on in your courses. But for now, all you need to know is that it's a relationship between the lateral and longitudinal strain of a material. And the last point we need to cover for these types of problems is since we're now considering a strain in the z direction, we need to reconsider what the max possible shearing strain uh, that develops in the element could be. Because now the, the epsilon p3, or the normal strain p3, is no longer zero. So if you remember from our previous videos, the epsilon p3 here would have been zero, and, z and zero here as well. But now we have to consider these three different possibilities where a max strain could be developed. All right, so now we have everything we need to know to solve this problem. I've also added some recall equations here so we can do the principal strain calculations. 
Uh, but let's look at the rosette and see what we're dealing with. Now, a cool thing about this problem, we're starting off super easy here. Uh, the gauge on A lines up directly with the x-axis. So we can deduce that the strain obtained by uh, A is going to be equivalent to the normal strain in X. And then similarly with gauge C, it would be equivalent to the normal strain of Y. So we can actually write that down. The normal strain in A will equal to the normal strain in X, which in our case is equal to 750 micro, whatever the units, millimeter per millimeter, yada, yada. Epsilon B we will come back to, and epsilon C, or normal strain C, will be equivalent to the normal strain of Y, which is equal to negative 250 and then micro. Now, let's take a look at epsilon B. We're given the value here, but it's not equivalent to epsilon X or epsilon Y. It will be equivalent to something different. Let's just denote it as epsilon at 45 degrees from X, which will be equal to negative 125 micro. Let's write down that the theta for this value will equal to 45 degrees. Now, what else is the problem asking for? It's wanting us to find the shearing strain x, y. But how are we going to determine this value? Well, we can actually isolate for shearing strain x, y in one of these equations. And I'm going to choose the shearing, uh, normal strain at b equation to determine this. But why? Why am I going to do this? Well, this equation is useful for determining the shearing strain x, y because we cannot deduce the change in size based on gauges A or C because they are in line with their respective axis X and Y. The only gauge that can dictate uh, whether there was a size change from these two gauges will be this gauge here. So we're actually gonna see that in the problem. And you can see that numerically as well. If you plug in the theta values here, so for A it would be zero, this whole component will be zero, when you bring it over, you're dividing by zero, and it's going to be a similar thing with C. So let's take epsilon B for our equation. So what will the normal strain of B be equal to? It will be equal to negative 125. And we're simply plugging into this equation here. We're going to be solving for that shearing strain x. All right, and when you isolate to bring the shearing strain x, y uh, to the other side of the equation, you're going to be left with something like this. You have negative 125 subtracting negative 375 plus 125 divided by 0.5. This value will give you negative 750 micro, and then you can do gradients here. Now, the next thing we can do is actually determine where this principal plane is going to be uh, to obtain these principal strains. The problem doesn't ask for this, but it's very helpful to know uh, in case you need to do a drawing for uh, the point, as we've done previously. So as you know, in order to get the orientation of that element, we have to isolate for this alpha p. And to do that, we take the equation. We're bringing over that 2, which is turning it into 1 half. We're taking the 10 inverse of the equation on the other side. And we're just plugging in the values that we solved for previously. So we have negative 750 over epsilon x, which was found 750 minus epsilon y, which is minus 250. And solving for that, you're left with an angle of negative 18.4 approximately. And what that means is that we're actually going to be going clockwise with respect to the x axis. And this is going to be helpful once again if you need to draw what the point is going to look like in that orientation for principal planes. Now let's determine what the principal strains are that are acting at that orientation. We have a formula that we've used previously. So we know that epsilon P1 and P2 will be represented by this formula up here. So let's plug in our values and determine both of these strains. All right, so now we plugged it all in, and we remember that adding the root is going to be representing normal strain P1, and the opposite, subtracting that root, is going to be for epsilon P2. And these values are going to give you 875 for P1 and negative 375 for P2. 
Now P3, as we recall, has to be represented as we talked about earlier in this video. And we have a calculation for this, which is going to be as follows. We have the negative 0.3 on top for that Poisson's ratio divided by 1 minus 0.3. And we are taking the normal strain x and y as we determined earlier. Minus 250. And this will equal 2, negative 214. Lastly, we have the max shearing strain. And as we remember from our previous videos, if we had two opposite signs for P1 and P2, we know that this first case will be governing. So we don't need to check the other two cases. So we can just proceed with epsilon P1 minus epsilon P2 as our max shearing strain, which will equal to 875 minus negative 350, or 375, sorry, which is equal to 1,250 micro radians. And these are your final answers for the problem. Seven different answers. Um, so yeah, I hope that helped and I'll catch you guys in the next video.